Thank you very much. <clears throat> Thank you very much, Klaus, for allowing me the opportunity of being with here with you uh, today. I won't entertain you for more than 15 minutes. I know they already went out and the launch is waiting for us. <clears throat> the earliest written sources for Colombian popular music are the scores of dance <clears throat> and salon music published as supplements to newspapers dating from the late 1840s. The first of those are El Neogranadino, a modern newspaper started in 1848 in Bogotá that during two years included engraved scores of contradanzas, mazurcas, polcas, valses, and other dances for piano, guitar, and flute by local professional and amateur, by local professional and amateur composers, amongst them some women. The main aim of these scores was entertainment but the editors also saw music as a token of good education and social polishing. Similar collections followed, <clears throat> mostly in literary magazines as El Mosaico between 1865 and 68, but the most important one is perhaps that collection is perhaps that of Mundo al Día, where weekly scores were published between 1924 and 1938. During the first half of the 19th century, some scores appeared in other magazines, but by the 1960s, they disappeared completely. From, 18th, from the 1870s and 1880s, we have a few important anthological manuscripts, mainly collections of songs, cancioneros, or dance pieces that include the first attempts to put popular music in music notation. For manuscripts and publications featuring dance music of an earlier period, 1830s and 40s, the concept of revival is more appropriate. Likewise, in the 1890s, Colombian composers and musicologists Santos y Fuentes and Narciso Garay wrote down in manuscript with the intention to publish them popular, music they, pardon, popular pieces they knew by heart or some they collected nearby Bogota. These collecting trips might have counted with phonograph, sonophones or graphophones documented from 1897 onwards. Important to mention amongst the manuscript sources are sets of orchestral parts of dance orchestras of the 1930s and 40s, now in public and private music archives, fortunately now being catalogued and studied. Our last category <clears throat> amongst the written sources are the tutors for local popular musical instruments. We have them for the tiple, the bandola, manduria, and even for the citara, cither, dating from the 1860s to the 1920s. Some are crudely printed locally, either with movable types or block printing, or at, and at least one is printed in Europe using modern engraving technology. Music iconography is not a secondary source of popular music history, but alas, it is difficult to handle. We have plenty of photographs starting in the 1860s and starting from the 1860s and newspaper ads from the late 1910s. As well, <clears throat> we are the art of sheet music, uh, sheet music covers. However, most prominent today are LP and album covers. <clears throat> they have been receiving increasing attention from all quarters and have acquired great value in the market. In the case of Colombia, those of tropical dance music and psychedelia are the most looked after. Show business magazines and published songbooks were not considered worth collecting in libraries and archives. And only now, its usefulness is revealed by the scarcity of other sources documented dance and pop music. Amongst other non-conventional sources of music are music programs, concert collections of concert tickets, posters, and other music memorabilia. So far, this has been the material related to RISM and the four R's. Have we really contributed to these programs from Colombia, and I say by extension from Latin America? But before trying to answer that question, we have to look at other sources crucial to the study of popular music. The Colombian sheet music printing industry never developed properly in the 19th and 20th century because the public, players, 
instruments and music venues never gained the critical mass necessary to sustain it. From around 1852 to 1856, we have <clears throat> our first engraved commercial sheet music dedicated to the Bambuco, the epitome of national music, in formal variations following the model of the showpieces for piano by Louis Moreau Gochalk. In 1857 and 58, 20 year old Manuel Maria Parraga, who belonged to an educated and wealthy family, had his piano works printed by Breiko van Hertel in Leipzig, not as part of their catalog, but as a deluxe collection the house provided to amateurs, I suppose also at the deluxe price. <coughs> Bogotá newspapers adds, <clears throat> of February 1859s announced them as novelties and Parraga's works, as many of these periods, are borderline cases. Some are to be played and listened to, but others are dance pieces. By 1900, music typewriters and mimeograph or stencil duplication become available. And we have a lot of examples of this blue ink music <clears throat> that proved to be cheaper and easier to distribute. We have a significant number of pieces at that period by the, lit uh, by the lithographies of San Permatis in the 1880s, G. Navia in the 1910s, the Repertorio Latinoamericano from 1916 onwards, and from the 1930s to the 1960s by the Casa Nacional Humberto Conti, the main music dealers in Colombia. A quick perusal of one of the many bound books of sheet music of around 1860 to 1920s, some now stored in libraries and archives, but also found in antiquaries and flea markets, show a great deal, score, a great deal of scores of popular music for piano and piano and voice published in Mexico, Cuba, the United States and Europe with a minimal of local materials. <clears throat> there are important sheet music collections <clears throat> in libraries and archives around the world particularly in the United States and Europe, that are now available in the internet, but the work with ours is still in its infancy. In the 1880s, console music boxes start using interchangeable discs with individual pieces, and those become the first automatic players with musical options playing fashionable pieces sold in 15-inch perforated discs of metal and other materials. Very quickly, automated pianos followed. Player pianos, <coughs> piano players, and reproducing piano, all operated with perforated rolls that set in motion a very complex pneumatic mechanic machine that played the keyboard of real pianos, in the case of the piano player and reproducing piano, or activated their hammers in the player piano. Some of these, sorry, some of these could be coin operated. We have piano rolls made with Colombian scores and some made in Bogota by local artists. All of them had great currency in Colombia until the 1920s. Nowadays, Music in existing piano rolls can be recovered through digital scanning and conversion to MIDI files. By 1910, the phonograph have left them behind. As recording machines were available from 1897 onwards, cylinders with Colombian music should have existed during this period but unfortunately we have not been able to locate them. International music cylinders were available <clears throat> and there are some specimens, but some of them, one collection for instance, were bought by collectors in recent years. Having started with professional and amateur Colombian artists recording for international companies such as Columbia, Victor and Brunswick from 1908, <clears throat> Onwards, only in 1913, with portable equipment, Victor made the first acoustic recordings in Bogota. <clears throat> Sorry. 
They were all devoted to Colombian and international dance music. Recordings continued abroad in New York and Camden, New Jersey in the late 1910s and early 20s. And many Colombian artists were present when the new electric recording technology was implemented. But only in 1939 and 40, electrical recordings were made in Colombia. But the records have to be stamped in Mexico, Chile, or Argentina by the RCA or Odeon due to wartime shortages. Soon after 1945, the first commercial records are produced in Colombia. And by 1950, LPs of 10 inches, 20 inches, 45 RPMs, and in the mid-1960s, EPs were introduced. However, 10-inch shellac 78 RPM records were still in use in a recording industry until the 1970s, a market driven by tropical dance music and pop. These are the records <clears throat> produced by the pop group The Speakers between 1966 and 1968 that were the primary sources I used to study their repertoire and to reconstruct their musical history. For these sources, the discography of American historical recordings, a platform for, of the University of California at Santa Barbara is no doubt the most success, successful of its kind, worth of every praise and emulation. Musical instruments have been always <clears throat> a great source of information for music history, for popular music history. With the arrival of, arrival of automation, so have become phonographs, microphones, amplifiers, speakers, tape recorders, disc cutting machines, and other hardware inherent to the phonographic and music industries. Electronics brought the synthesizer and now samplers and software. Digital drum kits, for instance, are very important in the musical analysis of recent musical trends in pop and fusion. This list includes transcription or radio station turntables, such as the Gates CB500 for 16-inch acetate discs used as samples and for archiving and distributing material to be broadcasted. All jukeboxes contain also valuable information when they retain their discs or their lists of selections. Collectors are a unique species, as Robert Haxma portrays them. And in Latin America, very few of them envisage that their materials can be useful for scholarly research. And when they do, they try to do it themselves. Usually after death, collections are left with no catalog and often with beautiful but dead wet pages. Besides collectors, besides collectors collection are not museum of, of archives or at best they are unstable ones. They usually sell items to pay for their daughter's weddings or for the rent of their many storerooms. Moreover, they sell to other collectors, very rarely to museum or archives that nowadays don't even receive gifts, let alone buying collections. From its initial issues in early 1973, the emblematic journal Early Music included a section about the musical instruments, scores, and other musical items auctioned at the London sale rooms. It has been always very difficult to track auctioned items unless they are brought by public institutions. And even in this case, years pass before they are available to researchers. If the buyer is private, these instruments or musical, inst or musical documents have proven to be very difficult to examine. Something similar can be said about the current market of the music sources I mentioned above. Platforms as Discogs.com, 45 Worlds, and PopPsych.com combine impressive databases 
services for buying and selling records, and criteria for establishing their prices in the market. Their databases are very useful, but incomplete, and depend on the contribution of associates, creating, creating great instability in the virtual collection. A Colombian local example is that of a private collection of objects pertaining to broadcasting and the history of the recording industry, where many of my photographs come from. The collection is called Museum of Telecommunications and Electronic Media and belongs to Mr. Carlos Sanchez. It is open to the public by appointment for a small fee, but unfortunately, it is also an unstable museum, as it does not have the economic means to maintain it and sells and loans items to produce additional income. Examining sources for popular music in Colombia made me conclude some time ago that it has been the most important element of Colombian music history. Another conclusion is that the study of popular music has been in the hands of amateurs and only lately has become a preoccupation for musicology. In our case, popular music has never been isolated from academic music. So, strengthening the criteria for the treatment of musical sources, as in the case of Robert Eidner's uh, project, could be a good example to follow. For that, do we need institutions like RISM or the other R's to work with the music sources I just mentioned? Can we follow the OCLC World Cat example with its 2 billion records in 485 languages? We could start articulating national existing databases of these sources, particularly sheet music and records. So to establish some transnational network, networks following the several working examples we all know. These are the issues I have been pondering in my last works, and I believe we should be discussing them as soon as possible. Thank you very much.